Hey friends, what's good? Derek here from Bomb Socks with another day of Bomb Bites where we feast upon the words of Christ one bite at a time. So I'm grateful that we had our recent general conference where we had a chance to be able to listen to our prophets and apostles. And I love our 12 apostles. I love listening to these wonderful men. I love seeing their personalities. I love seeing their various ways of teaching. They are all different, but they are all very effective as being apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's fun for us to get to know their names, get to know their backgrounds and all of those things. And I love the information that the church has provided for us to be able to really get to know these men. Now, with that said, if we were to do a random sampling, random survey of members of the church out there and ask them one question, I'd be curious how they respond. The question is, can you name all of the original 12 Nephite disciples? Now, I've been teaching seminary for almost 30 years, and I think I could maybe name one or two of them. These are men we just don't know a lot about, but I love how in chapter 19 of 30, Nephi, Jesus mentions them by name. In fact, you go to verse number four, came to pass that on the morrow when the multitude was gathered together, behold, Nephi, who was the prophet at the time, and his brother, whom he had raised from the dead, whose name is Timothy, and also his son, whose name was Jonas, and also Methoni, and Mathonihah, his brother, and Cuman, and Cumanonhi, and Jeremiah, and Shemnon, and Jonas, and Zedekiah, and Isaiah. Now, these were the names of the disciples whom Jesus had chosen. Came to pass, they went forth and stood in the midst of the multitude. You know, we need to bring some of those names back to our day. We do not see a lot of Shemnons and Cumanon highs these days. So you're looking for baby names, great place to start right here, right? Now you fast forward to chapter 28, which is what we're studying this week. And you go through the first three verses and you see some cool things happening here. It came to pass that when Jesus had said these words, so he just taught them about, look, here's my gospel, here's my church, you call it by my name. I want you to not only come unto me, but I want you to become more like me so you can bless other people's lives. When Jesus had said these words, he spake unto his disciples one by one. That's how the Savior works with people, right? Saying unto them, what is it that ye desire of me after I am gone to the Father? Great question. Again, here's Jesus asking what they all would desire. And they all spake, save it were three. We'll talk about these guys in a second. Saying, we desire that after we have lived unto the age of man, that our ministry wherein thou hast called us may have an end, that we may speedily come unto thee in thy kingdom. What a great request. In fact, Jesus calls it a really good request in verse three. Blessed are ye because ye have desired this thing of me. Therefore, after that ye are 70 and two years old, apparently that's the age of a man, so dudes out there watching this, apparently you don't hit manhood until you're 72, right? Ye shall come unto me in my kingdom, and with me ye shall find rest. What a great request, and what a cool outcome. Now, after this wonderful request of the nine, verse number four, he turns himself to the three and said unto them, what will ye that I should do unto you when I am gone unto the Father? And then verse number five, they sorrowed in their hearts, for they durst not speak unto him the thing which they desired. I can just picture these three just standing there going, oh, you you tell him, I don't know. Uh, nervous. To, they have these righteous desires and they're just like, we don't know how to ask what the desire of our heart is. And while they're sitting there stewing over this, Jesus in verse number six said unto them, behold, I know your thoughts, and ye have desired the thing which John, my beloved, who was with me in my ministry, before that I was lifted up with the Jews, desired of me. And here is where we are introduced to the great legend of the three Nephites. Now, what's interesting is nowhere in scripture are they actually referred to as the three Nephites. We've kind of just created this three Nephites idea, and they may not even have been Nephites. These might have been three Lamanites, but they are Nephite disciples who had a really cool and ambitious request. And when it comes to these three, there are so many urban legends out there, some of which might actually be true. A uh, little picture here I saw where, finally, thanks to our three strapping strangers who agreed to fill in when our scheduled speakers all canceled at the last minute. And it says, the legend of the three Nephites grows. Now, one of the most important things to understand about these three is when it comes to them, there are more questions than there are answers. And I can't tell you the number of times over the years I have had so many questions about these three. You know, who are they? Do they work together? Are they individual? Does the prophet know who they are? Can they like change their appearance? Do they have families? How do they eat? Where do they eat? How do they provide for themselves? So many questions that I just quite frankly don't have the answers to. But fortunately, the scriptures do give us some clarity on some things. So today I want to give you quickly 
eight truths about the three Nephite disciples. I figured we would focus on the things we know rather than focusing on the things that we may or may not know. Now, let me just show you these truths right here. First of all, it says, and a lot of them actually come from this chapter, they will never taste of death or they will never endure the pains of death. When the Savior comes in his glory, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye from mortality to immortality. Except for the sorrow they feel for the sins of the world, they do not experience pain or sorrow. What a cool little request there. They help people become converted unto the Lord. They cannot be killed or harmed in any way. It's kind of funny. You go to verses 19 to 22 in chapter 28, and I almost think these are kind of comical in some way. They were cast into prison by them who did not belong to the church, and the prisons could not hold them, for they were rent in twain. Every time they get thrown into prison, the prisons just fall apart. Verse 20, they were cast down into the earth, but they did smite the earth with the word of God. That's kind of cool. Insomuch that by his power they were delivered out of the depths of the earth. Therefore, they could not dig pits sufficient to hold them. They keep digging deeper pits and these guys just come out of it. I don't know how all that worked out, but that had to frustrate a bunch of people, right? Thrice they were cast into a furnace and received no harm. There's your Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reference, right? Verse 22, twice they were cast into a den of wild beasts, and behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a suckling lamb and received no harm. I can just picture them almost like a Daniel in the lion's den type of thing where they get thrown into this den of lions and they're just sitting there scratching the lion's bellies and playing with them like cats. Kind of humorous, but a cool way to show how they have been protected from the Lord so that they can continue to minister and help out. The next one, Satan cannot tempt them or have any power over them. That's a cool promise. They remain in a translated state until the judgment day where they will be resurrected and received into a kingdom of God. And then this is kind of a cool one. They ministered to Mormon and his son Moroni some 400 years later. In fact, Mormon and Moroni do not give their identities because they want to make sure these guys are able to stay low key and be able to do what they had requested to do. Now, as you're listening to this story about the three Nephite disciples, this is all fascinating. I love it. So what, right? Now, there's a cool little principle right here. You go all the way back to where the Savior said, what is it that you desire of me? Well, cool little quote from Elder Neal A. Maxwell, where he said, what we insistently desire over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Righteous desires need to be relentless, therefore. So I love how the Savior will grant unto you the desires of your heart. So our desires need to be very righteous. These guys wanted to minister for the rest of time. That is a righteous desire, and the Lord granted unto them their righteous desires. I just think this whole story is a great story and teaches some cool little principles along the way as well. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for subscribing and thanks for sharing these messages. As always, so grateful that you do that. If you like what you see, click that like button and you got to go check out our amazingly comfortable gospel theme socks at bombsocks.com. Godspeed. See you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.